to Zoom with me during our virtual forum, Dear Recovery, You Saved My Life. I, I really am humbled and, and really thankful for everybody who is taking some of the time out of their day. Uh, the days have been kind of crazy lately, so I, I just want to emphasize how truly I appreciate it. Um, the one thing that I, I want to, while I'm going through this, this is a, a little different presentation that I'm normally giving. Uh, this is a really a personal journey of what it was like for me to go through recovery and, and my past. Uh, other presentations I do are a little bit more clinical, but this, is, uh, this was something I was really excited to do um, because it, is, uh, it, it basically talks about some of the struggles I had and where I'm at right now. Uh, the other thing, uh, this will be, when, we're, when I'm finished talking, um, there's going to be time for questions and comments. Any question you have, uh, regardless of how personal you might think it is for me, um, ask. Because uh, I, it, why I do this is because I really want to help as many people as possible. And so if there's anything related to my story that you have questions about, please, please ask. And if you don't feel comfortable in this forum asking, uh, at the end of the email address, reach out to me that way. Any, any way I can help, I, I want to do. Um, so... Why I am open about my recovery. Um, number one, stigma kills. Uh, it's stigma. I've seen it a lot when I was working in, a, in, a, in the hospital specifically. Um, people were ashamed of having their diagnosis. They either came from treatment uh, or they gave up on treatment. Um, and I, I felt like stigma is a big part of my story too. I, uh, as, you'll, as you'll hear, um, it was, it's something that I, I was ashamed of. I mean, I was ashamed of, of having an addiction, which wasn't uh, basically masking my underlining like trauma and depression. Um, toxic masculinity, you know, that man up kind of, uh, you know, uh, presentation the, that men shouldn't really be talking about their feelings or men should be really strong and not go to therapy, which I think is a lot of BS. I will be watching my language in during this one because there might be some kids ears. Um, but I, but I, I want to, I want to like put it out there that it's, it's actually pretty strong of people to, to go to therapy and to, you know, talk about their recovery from a mental health diagnosis or an addiction. Um, suicide, uh, as you can read by the stats, uh, that, the it's an epidemic, just like the opioid epidemic. And I, I actually think alcohol is still an epidemic killing people. Um, but in the past 10 years, this suicide rate has tripled for um, kids 10 to 24. Uh, and that's a, on the average, I mean, those, these two numbers are scary and it's like, on an average 129 people a day die by suicide and 130 Americans die each day from an opioid overdose. Um, approximately 21 million have at least one addiction, 10% are in treatment. I mean, those numbers are, are, are mind boggling. Um, so that is why I want to put my story out there, and that's why I really appreciate everybody sharing this with me. So this is my story. Um, here we go. So the, the first nine years of my life, um, I, I felt, looking back, were pretty magical. Um, I, have, I had two amazing parents. Uh, that's my mom right here, uh, and that's my dad. When I did this live, my mom, and the whole time, she's like, listen, Pat, don't embarrass me. All right, whatever you do, don't embarrass me. And I'm like, Mom, like your pictures are going to be on the PowerPoint. You don't want me to acknowledge you that you're in the crowd. She can acknowledge me, but just really, very briefly. Um, so I, I jumped off where I was presenting, and I ran up to her and pointed at her and said, this is my mom. Then she got a standing She got an ovation. Yeah, my mom does not like me that much. Um, but 1975, they married. Um, my dad was a Philadelphia fireman. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. That's my dad right there in the middle. You can just see his head. And in 1978, July 11th, 1978, I was born. I was, the, <laughs> I was their bundle of joy. Um, and there I am. And uh, so that's my dad holding me. I, as obvious, I, I did have hair. So I was, uh, that was my dad, engine six. Uh, that was his old red car. But now most people who know me don't picture this as the, as the appearance I look. I, I mean, that looks that's pretty snazzy right there with the bow tie, 
you know? Uh, most people who know me and those who are watching this and probably gonna maybe get to know me, probably picture this way more than the clean side of, of Little Pat. Um, so that's my dad, St. Patty's Day. He was, he was fun. He was engaging. That is my sister right here, uh, Melissa McElwain. She's two years younger. Uh, she is a suicide prevention coordinator for the Coatesville VA. She does amazing work. Um, that's my brother, Steve. Um, I hope he's watching right now because I'm pretty sure he still holds on to that little leprechaun doll. Um, you're welcome, Steve. Uh, but um, we just, we had a fun, fun childhood. I mean, I, I just remember a lot of good memories with my dad and my mom. Uh, we, can, uh, we would do like down the shore uh, for a week. We did the Northeast Philly thing, which is down the shore for a week. Um, just fun activities, uh, two loving parents. Um, my dad was involved with Penn Academy Athletic Association and as a fireman, and he worked for Jerry's, and he did a side jo job. Um, but my parents just really kept us involved. Uh, that's my buddy, Harry Doms. Um, I can proudly say right now he's got a, a story of his own uh, regarding alcoholism, and he celebrated four years recovery. Um, almost dying from alcohol, but I just wanted to throw him in there. The success stories in, in recovery are, are pretty awesome. Um, and that's me is, like I said, we fun. Karate Kid. I think that was Karate Kid. That's my mom. My sister was a witch. My brother was <laughs> an old lady. And, uh, you know, just happy. The five of us. They were just, we were just happy family. So July 11th. 1987. I was nine years old. Um, we were we did something new, and everybody was really excited about it. Uh, we were going to go up the mountains for a week. So instead of going the Wildwood, which we used to do every year, um, we decided to go up the mountains. I remember being really excited because we were leaving on my birthday. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. We were staying a whole week. And that was me playing basketball. Uh, I remember playing basketball with a like not like a real basketball, but with one of those like marble blue balls that barely bounce. Um, I, I actually thought I was going to be an NBA basketball player at that time, which <laughs> did not turn out the way I thought it would. Um, fun activities. Uh, I, as you can tell, I really liked that cowboy hat a little maybe too much. Um, we went paddle boat. Uh, I remember from this week-long trip up the mountains uh, going to a – in Mount Pocono, there's a, a candle store. And I don't know why this candle store meant so much to me, but I just remember going in there. Um, and it was, a, it was a cool, awesome place to be. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. So that's a picture of my dad. So that picture in the middle is the last picture we have of my dad. Um, so my mom made a comment to him. Uh, I mean, my mom was taking pictures like crazy. And my, my mom, my dad was like, that's it. I'm done. No more pictures. And my mom's like, well, at least give it a good one. And that was his, that was his good picture right there. And uh, at this resort up the mountains, there was a pool. Um, it was like the big attraction at this resort. Um, we... And all the kids, we were all going down it, like, like face first. And it was so much fun. And my dad, if you knew my dad, he was, like, the most – he was a social butterfly. Everybody loved him. He could make friends like that. Uh, he kept telling my mom the entire time, I'm going down that slide. I'm going down that slide. My mom do it now. No, no, other parents are watching and stuff like that. But before I leave, I'm going down that slide. So it was July 17th, uh, the, the night before we were supposed to leave. And uh, all the kids are, we're all playing in, in the outside. We're playing tag. And my dad is walking along and he comes up to me and he says, Pat, and I remember this pretty, pretty, pretty in, intimately. Um, he says, you want to take a walk with me? And I was playing with my new friends and my brother and sister. Uh, so I told my dad uh, that, no, I didn't want to go for a walk with him. And I wanted to keep playing. Now, in my head, I imagine him saying, I love you, and me saying, I love you, but I don't know. So, but I would love to think that still happened. 
So I did not go for a walk with him. And uh, July 18th, 1987, my, uh, we're, so in this, in this cabin we were in, um, it was one bedroom, my, myself, my brother, who was three at the time, and my dad in one bed, and my sister and my mom in another bed. Well, we had the resort manager, which now I know is the resort manager, come in our room July 18th, the morning of. And I, I don't know what she said to us, but she let us know that my dad passed away. And I remember my brother and my sister leaving the room and running out and crying. And I leaned over and started looking out the window, and I just remember the sun hit me in the face. Um, I just couldn't forget that. I don't know how long I laid there, um, but when I walked out, this has always stuck with me because it felt like slow motion. I opened up the door and my mom came up to me in slow motion and hugged me. And the room was filled with police and strangers who I didn't know. Um, so the, the story about what they believe happened was that my dad was a social butterfly and he went for a walk and he met uh, friends who were staying at a, another cabin. Um, and he had about six beers with them. That's what was in his uh, system. That was something as a family we didn't really talk about. Uh, we didn't want to talk about that. Um, I'm, I think we're kind of like embarrassed a little bit. Uh, so they believe that late the night of the 17th, he went up down the slide. He did get his, his clothes were piled in a meat pile along with four Budweiser cans. Now, why we believe he was at a friend's house that he met there is my dad was a Bush guy. Like, he drank Bush beer. Um, and another family there was drinking Budweiser's. And um, they're not going to give out at the bar, like, four separate beers. And it, like, we believe that he there, had about a six-pack, came back, said, you know what, I'm going to go down that slide. He went down the slide. They believe he choked, panicked, and drowned. Um, in the police reports, somebody around 11 o'clock heard choking and decided not to check on it. Uh, and we believe that was my dad. So that's a, that was a life-changing moment in my life. And that kind of starts my, my, my story of where, uh, so the one thing I loved, the Philadelphia Fire Department were the most amazing, supportive, loving people ever. Uh, I remember the first Christmas without my dad, we had like three fire trucks there. Um, we got a bunch of toys and everything. They went over and beyond and they continued to go over and beyond. And I still think they notify my mom and it's been over 30 years. Uh, and I just like, I just want to read this on Saturday, July 18th, 1987, the members of engine six number engine six and ladder number 16, along with the entire fire department were saddened by the news that Pat McElwain had drowned while vacationing in the Poconos with his family. Formerly of ladder number 24, Pat had been stationed at engine number six for the past seven years. Pat had survived by his wife, Josephine, and children, Patrick Jr., age nine, Melissa, age five, and Stephen, age three. Pat is remembered as a great father and husband. He was an all-around good guy, always ready to lend someone a helping hand. Pat was an active member of St. Catherine's Parish and was also involved with the Penn Academy Athletic Association. Members of engine number six and ladder number 16 remember Pat as being always full of fun. It seems he always had a smile on his face. Pat was quite a fisherman, but not the best card player this department has ever seen. We all remember Pat as an aggressive firefighter and an active member of local number 22. But most of all, remember Pat as our brother and good friend. We love you, laddie boy, and we're going to miss you. So like that, my mom was a single mom with Patrick, Melissa, and Stephen. Um, so in this picture, we, we do look like angels. We weren't. <laughs> I give my mom a lot of credit. Uh, and my mom did what she needed to do. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She started to work. She started to work at St. Catherine of Siena. Uh, she needed to uh, provide for us. My mom wasn't driving at the time. She learned how to drive. Uh, just an amazingly, unbelievably strong woman. She did everything in her power to help us. Uh, she was loving, supportive, everything in her life to make sure her kids got what they needed. 
Um, she put us in therapy. Truthfully, I, I don't even remember it that much, but I know we went, I think we went to Cora. Um, this is my grade school I went to. I went to St. Catherine of Siena in, uh, in Northeast Philly. But she, she did everything that a, that a, that a great parent does. Um, so that's me right there. There's my brother. There's my sister. Um, we started to, like, I, it's interesting because I, I was bullied in, in, uh, in, uh, in grade school and early on in high school. Uh, I just felt like something was missing. Um, I, later on, it, when I get into, like, my recovery piece and, and working on myself, like, I, I just remember people, like, my, my dad died when I was nine, and I didn't think it was a trauma. Because later on in my life, I was like, it happened when I was nine years old. But I was going through trauma. Um, something was missing. One of the things my mom always talks about when I was in grade school is I came home crying one day from school. And I think a lot of people were saying, well, you're the man of the house. You're the man of the house. And I heard that a lot. And, as a, and from probably people who really cared and, and loved and they weren't trying to like put me in a spot that was like pretty tough. But I remember coming home and crying and, and, my, and saying, Mom, I can't be the man of the house. I just can't do it. I'm so sorry. I was crying hysterically. And my mom said the things that, like, I just remember, like, holding on to. She goes, Pat, Patrick, how old are you? And I said, nine. And she goes, all I want you to be is a nine-year-old boy. That's all. And that just helped. Um, so I graduated um, from grade school. And I went to high school. I went to Archbishop Ryan. And uh, I continue to, like, I, I had low self-esteem. Um, I didn't feel like I, I belonged. I was a nice guy. I think everybody liked me. Uh, I was bullied. Um, there was, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable a lot in, in, my, own, in my own skin. Uh, but I looked good. I mean, that shirt right there looked pretty good. Uh, that's my brother. My sister, on the outside, it looks like I'm doing pretty well. Um, but I definitely didn't have, I had, like, low self-esteem. And I could see that, like, really apparent, especially in my struggles with my addiction. Yeah, I, I love showing these pictures of my brother uh, because you're going to get to the point. He's six foot three now, so my little brother is way taller than me. It's not fun as an older brother. But I used to. So my freshman year, and then early on in my sophomore year, I I used to tell my buddies all the time, uh, every because everybody was drinking. Well, everybody I was around was drinking alcohol. Uh, some were smoking weed, and I would come home and I I would tell my mom. I'd be like, Mom, you're not gonna believe this, but John, Sean, John, they're all like, they're all drinking in the woods and they're doing this and like, and that stopped. My mom knew, like, when I started drinking, because of that stopped. My first time drinking alcohol, I went to a buddy's house. He snuck out a couple, like, pounders. Uh, I had a sip of it, and I remember thinking to myself, and knowing that my dad died of this. I knew this. And I used to always say, I'm never going to drink. I've seen what it done. It killed my dad. And I walked home with a buddy of mine, and I was like, Dude, that was gross. I'm never drinking. And he said the same thing. That weekend, I went to an uh, older kid's house. The older kids kind of liked me. I was a nice guy. Uh, I, had a, I had a pitcher of beer. I remember a pitcher of beer and got drunk, and that was it. Like, that was it. I remember that night so well because I loved that feeling. Like, I felt free. This is, uh, we went up the mountains, and... We, this is after like drinking started to be what we did. Like everything started to involve alcohol. Uh, and we went up the mountains here. And uh, I remember we snuck a bottle of Jack Daniels uh, into the woods. And I, we had my buddy's dad made this horrible breakfast. <laughs> like it made everybody nauseous. It was like runny eggs and everything. And we were in the woods and, and we were passing it around and nobody could drink it. And I was like, oh, let me try. And I drank it down. And I just remember thinking, how can you guys not want to go further with this? Like, how could you not want to get drunk right now? 
And I started to drink a lot. I started to get in trouble for my drinking. I started to get punished. I started to sneak alcohol in my house. I started to take all my mom's alcohol and fill it up with water. I thought I was pretty funny because um, my mom came downstairs one time. I snuck a bunch of people in, a bunch of friends in. They left. I was passed out on the on the ground. And I instead of telling my mom what really happened as I snuck a bunch of people in, I said, Mom, I, I did this by myself. I got drunk. I had to go to therapy. My mom did it. Like I said, I put her through the ringer. Um, so I went to therapy and they gave me uh, an assessment. And I lied on the assessment. I, I totally broke down my drinking big time. And I remember they came back to me and they said, uh, we believe, and my mom was there. That's great. Uh, we believe you have a problem with drinking. And I was like, wait a minute. I, I was about to say, but I lied on that. Like, how, how can you even say there's no way that came out that I have a problem with drinking? Uh, so whatever my mom did, whatever the therapist said to me, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Uh, this is, again, you, you wouldn't tell, like, in my mind, an alcoholic doesn't look like that. An, an alcoholic doesn't look like that. I was doing, I, I was doing okay in school. Not my potential, but I was getting by. The one thing that I was doing is I was like causing my mom a lot of problems. Uh, I was getting into trouble in certain areas. And that, actually I was very lucky in a lot of the things I was doing. Um, so this is what I really believed um, alcohol gave me. The, the gifts of alcohol for me. So these are some of the things that, that I could not do before alcohol was introduced to my life. Um, I started to ask girls out, drunk, but ask them out and they would want to go out with me. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like I'm actually dating girls and, and they like me. Uh, not, not me, but because I wouldn't have done that if it wasn't for the alcohol. Um, sticking up for people, sticking up for myself. The bullying stopped. Uh, I went to, uh, I, I was at a, we were all drinking at a basketball court and some, somebody uh, came up to this kid who was younger than us and tried, rock, tried stealing his bike. This kid now, the younger kid is now a cop and who I even reached out to about this presentation. And uh, he was get, by two older kids, they were trying to take his bike. And I was, I was feeling pretty good. And I went up and I said, yo, put that bike down. What do you, like, you, don't leave this kid alone, man. And he, the kid got in my face, my first real fight. I, I took it to him. And I remember, and all of a sudden that night, I felt good because I defended somebody who was getting bullied. And the bullying stopped with me. The gift of alcohol. Because in my mind, I'm not doing that if I don't have the courage to step in and help that kid out. Now, when I ran, mentioned to John, who's a, a cop right now, about this story, he wrote back to me. It had nothing to do with alcohol. It had something to do with you wanting to defend somebody who's getting bullied. But in my heart, back in the day, I felt like it had a lot to do with alcohol. Just alcohol made me like more personable, made me feel good in my own skin. I thought that's the reason why people like me. Um, so started to go continue to maneuver through my life. Uh, I maturing, as you can tell, my brother's getting bigger than me. I still have hair there. That's nice. I like that. Uh, and uh, college. I think, I think college is where my drinking blew up. Uh, every, I was drinking in the morning. I was drinking every night. Uh, I, I tell some people what I was drinking toward the end of mine. I, was, I could drink a case of beer and, a, and some whiskey. Jameson was my thing in a night. Um, it was getting bad and bad and bad. Everything in my life surrounded. Anything I wanted to do, you want to go bowling? Let's drink. You want to go to the movies? Let's drink. You want to sit in? Let's drink. You know, it's, it's sad when you're drinking like a bottle of wine, you, you smile in the mirror and your teeth are purple. Um, I was... The drinking was more important than anything and everything, including myself. 
so so I got arrested down the shore. Um, good good son moment for my for my mom to get that phone call. Uh, it was for like fighting and, and underage drinking, and I laughed about it. Um, and people that I, I have, I have a good way of charming people and like, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody gets arrested down the shore. It's Wildwood. I mean, that's what everybody does. You know, it's not a big deal. This isn't like a problem. I got this. I was in total denial. Like I was drinking every morning, noon and night. My mom, big outburst she had with me. And she said, and her father was a, a, a really bad alcoholic. My dad was a bad alcoholic. We have a lot of family members that are bad alcoholics. And she said to me in tears, you're the worst one I've ever seen in my life. You're the worst. But to me, you can't take this away from me. You, you can't. You're taking the gifts. I mean, you're taking the happiness that I have. You're taking, you're taking more than just alcohol away from me. Uh, but at Holy Family University, where I went, I was involved. Student government. It was easy for me. Student government planned events, fall ball, spring fling. What do you think that involved? Drinking. Um, I, I started to, to notice that things are getting, getting pretty bad. Um, so the 21st, my 21st birthday party was at my house. Uh, and as you guys can probably guess, I passed out going up the steps at the end of the night around three in the morning. And uh, I remember, I just, I, I remember right before my 21st birthday, I was really excited. I was talking to this older guy in the neighborhood, older guy. He was like eight years older than me. He's <laughs> like late 20s. And he said, uh, he said, Pat, I'll tell you, um, your drinking's probably going to calm down. You know, because once you turn 21, you mature and, you know, it's not that important anymore. And I remember the whole time he's talking to me being like, you are it. What is wrong with you? Are you serious? This is like the key to like my freedom. Like, if my mom bitches at me, I can just say, hey, I'm 21. I can go into a bar without worrying about getting uh, ID'd. Like, this was, like, like an immense freedom. Like, it was, I, I thought this was going to be, like, an amazing night for the rest of my future. So, it's, I'm about, like, 22, I think, and I go to visit my primary care physician, who was an amazing doctor. And uh, he, uh, I had blood work taken. He wanted to see me again. And he starts questioning me about my drinking. And I was like, yeah. He's like, how much do you drink? I said, I don't know, on the weekends, I guess. You know, like, I, I'm working. Like, I, I'm working. I'm doing pretty well. I, I, I'm, I'm in school. Like, things are, like, maneuvering pretty well, other than the relationships in my life got, like, looking horrible. And he had a, uh, a clipboard like this. And in the middle of me talking, he slams it on the table. And he looks at me and he goes, do you think this is an effing joke? Do you, think, you see this number right here? Do you see these liver enzymes? He's like, you have a fatty liver. You're, you're on the road to cirrhosis. You're not drinking every other weekend. You're drinking every night. That's what it's showing. And you're going to die from this. And I just remember, like, especially because we used to always, like, laugh about Penn State football and Eagles. It was a really nice – and for him to, like, yell at me like that, I was, like – I was, like, scared. Uh, I was, like, shaking. And I, and I went home and I, uh, I, I told my mom. I don't think she was that surprised. And I – for the next six months after that, I stopped drinking. Alcoholics don't do that. Alcoholics can't stop like that, right? You know, I don't need meetings or anything like that. I stopped. I started to work out. I started to really get in shape. So I, that was another thing that confirmed I didn't have a problem if I was able to stop for six months. And so, of course, six months later, we're down the shore on a vacation. This is interesting. And I had six months and I'm seeing people drinking and stuff like that. And I'm like, I got the test results back a couple months earlier that I was in good, clean, uh, good, clean health. Um, the fatty liver is something that is reversible, thank God. And I felt okay. So I remember telling my mom, I was like, mom, I'm going to go out and get a six pack. And she's like, but I said, mom, I'm good. Like, mom, I, I stopped drinking. I'm only gonna have a six pack. I'm gonna drink healthy now. Like I'm gonna drink in a, a in a way that is different than the way I did it before. And I remember we were playing like Parcheesi, the game, me, my brother, and my sister. 
and my mom, and I had to sit, and I said, I'm just going to have a few. So I had two, then I had three, then I had four, then I had five, then I had six. And the looks that my family members gave me, I could tell it was disappointment. And I said, listen, I'm heading out. I'll be right back. And they knew where I was going. In this picture, this is my cousin, Chris. And this is my cousin, Nick. They're, uh, they're brothers. Just amazing. Like, they're good guys. Like, they were good, loving guys, and they were friendly. Both of them died by overdose. Uh, that's my Uncle Joe in the middle. He had a, a problem with drugs. He went to Living Grin, and uh, he was able to, like, work his recovery. Uh, but uh, it's just, it's, it's all around. It's all around. It's all around me. And I, and I, I did like when we had family gatherings and stuff, I wanted to drink. I wanted to, I wanted to have some, some I wanted to join in on the fun. Uh, I felt, felt strange without having a couple drinks in me and being able to like have some fun with everybody. So, and then, and then she comes into the picture. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I graduated with my master's in 2004. Uh, alcoholics don't do that. Like people with problems with, with alcohol, they don't, they don't graduate with their masters. Uh, and I started to date her. Uh, sadly, the truth, I asked her out, very intoxicated, almost forgot I asked her out. Very, very quickly. Um, I, 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 I knew I loved her right from the very beginning. Um, she's professional, she's smart, she's beautiful that I felt like I wasn't. Um, and I felt good when I was around her. So I, we started dating and very, very early, I knew I was gonna lose her if I started drinking, kept my drinking up. Cause I was, I was drinking a case of beer. I was drinking Jameson. I was, uh, do you, I was drinking and driving a lot. Uh, I went through my mom's uh, twice, my mom's picnic bench in the back yard. Uh, door open, my mom yelling and screaming. It was, my, my drinking was like horrible. And uh, I made a, I put her through the ringer. Um, my wife is not somebody who, uh, you know, will, will, will cry or show them like sadness. Uh, and I had a conversation with her on the phone and uh, cause I did something stupid. And I heard her starting to like break up a little bit. And I, I turned off the phone. I mean, I stopped. This is June 23rd. I went downstairs and I went on to uh, the computer and I was looking for AA meetings because I was, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to lose her. This is getting bad. And my mom came down the steps and she goes, what are you doing? And I was like, mom, I can't do this anymore. I have to stop. And I gave her a hug and I just lost it. So June 23rd, 2005 is when I first entered AA. St. Tim's, Levicka Battersby, it was a beginner's meeting. Um, I didn't go for myself. I, I didn't go. I went for her uh, for Elise. She did everything possible. She went to the meetings with me. She sat with me. I could get a couple days sober, but then I started to sneak drinks. Uh, started to sneak, sneak smoking weed. Every once in a while, I'd have a pill, but that wasn't like a big issue. But I started to really continue to sneak alcohol. All of these right here. Denial, rationalization, projection. I'm not as bad as Joe Schmo down the street. Why do you keep getting on me? Uh, rationalize. How, hey, I have a master's and I'm working. I'm a therapist. I'm working as a therapist. Like, that can't possibly happen intellectualization, humor. Like I would make a joke all the time. I thought everything was funny. I'm hurting tremendously, but that's the way I handled my problems. I blamed others. Like I started to realize I could blame even the death of my dad on what's going on right now as a way, as an excuse to, of the reasons why I drank. Undoing. One of the things that stuck out to me is, uh, I, I, I said I'm sorry a lot to Elise, to my mom, to everybody. And I remember the one time Elise was like, I don't want to hear it anymore. Like, I don't want to hear I'm sorry. It, it means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. 
just stop doing it. Like your words mean nothing. So I was able to get a few solid months. And uh, no, I, I proposed to Elise and she said yes. She saw things in me, my current person who I am right now, that I didn't see. Uh, so I got a few solid months and uh, we got married. And yes, I sang to her on the wedding day. I have a beautiful voice. I sang Beginnings by Chicago. I'm pretty sure that I sang because I wanted to sing in front of everybody and not because one of the things I, I that's a beautiful thing right there. Please agree. Um, however, Elise was like, now, did you sing because you, I wanted you to, or because, you know, that's what I like to be the center of attention or because you wanted to be the center of attention. And, I, and my response was like, it's your wedding day. You're the center of attention. Does it matter if I'm singing? And, uh, I, th I thought I sang pretty well too. My neighbors, because I was still living at home, uh, we didn't move in and together until we got married. My neighbors hated me, probably, because I was practicing this song over and over again. So, so I, I wanted to stop. Um, I wanted to. I knew I was still drinking, and I was really deathly nervous about getting caught, uh, smelling of alcohol and stuff like that. So I ran into a buddy of mine, a, I'm sorry, a friend, quote that, and I was telling him, and he goes, yeah, well, why don't you just try this? And he hooked me up with some Percocets, give you the same feeling, and you don't even have to worry about drinking. You know, she won't be like giving you a hug and smelling you, uh, or, or saying that it smells like a certain, you know, liquor. Um, so I started that. And I started to really dive in to Percocets, uh, to Oxycontin, Oxy-80s was my thing, um, to Xanax. And it's interesting, like, I started to, like, deteriorate so, so quickly, um, so quickly. Uh, I started to use alcohol uh, more. I started to, like, really mess up at work. So what happened was I, uh, I got caught drinking. Uh, I was a therapist, uh, pretty, pretty good job. I got caught drinking and, and, and I at work. So I, I'm a caring, loving person and clients love me. And so they wanted to do whatever the possible to help me. So I was asked to take drug tests and they were keeping an eye on me and I was still using, I, was trying to get sneaky with like GHF, this drink to cover up marijuana and, and any and my alcohol use. And what happened was uh, I failed a drug test. So I went into uh, work one day and, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of like moments of shame, but one of the moments of shame is being walked out by somebody, collecting your belongings and being walked out. And I, I went to, uh, I, I was I was fired. Uh, I met my mom at Longhorn Steakhouse because I was in a really bad spot. And I think she was really worried about what I was going to do. And three hours later, they called me back up and they said, listen, Pat, you're great with your patients, your clients. We want you back. We're going to set something else up. And I remember hanging up and being like, wow, okay, I'm never going to drink. I'm never going to do a drug again. You know, like, this is like a lifesaver. That lasted a day. So that lasted a day. Um, so I use oxys, get myself, put myself in really bad situations. Blackout driving, blackout drunk, blackout drugged up driving. Uh, I was losing my marriage. And uh, I did something really, really tough. Like, one of the things that you shake, I almost killed myself and somebody else. Uh, Driving. It was February 11th, 2009. I just remember being like so shook. And I was like, I got it. Like, I need help. So, February 12th, 2009, I did that other thing where I went into an AA meeting. I again said I had one day. I, I did that so many times. Like, you ever, I raised my hand and I, I do they think I'm, I, I'm talking while I'm talking? I'm like, I don't even know if I believe myself that I want to stop. Like, I don't, I don't even know if I believe it. Like, forget you guys. 
Because I've said this so many times. Like how many times can someone relapse and say the same thing over again? Like I'm tired of using words. And uh, I was recommended to go to a, a psychiatrist. Uh, it was like a psychiatrist, psychologist in Center City, hour-long appointments, uh, pretty expensive. But Elise is like, listen, we're, you're, you're dying and we're going to lose you. You're going to lose your marriage. So we pulled out of our vacation fund to pay for this, for this therapy. And uh, so I went there. I'm sitting in the waiting room. And he comes out. He says, uh, Pat, come on back. I, I thought he was talking to himself. Like, we're going back, and he's, like, saying something under his breath. And uh, I sit down. I'm like, oh, man. Now, February 12, 2009, football season's over for Eagles fans. And I was like, oh, man, I thought the Eagles were going to have a good year. And he goes, I don't follow football. I don't like football. I don't. And I'm like, oh, okay. This is going to be this is gonna be a great, this is a great relationship. I'm glad I picked you out. Um, so I went through my story. I know my story. I talked about my dad talked about the bullying, talked about alcohol, talked about my relationships, talked about the drug use, talked about my work, talked about my relapse. I talked about almost dying over and over and over again and being so lucky to be alive. And I looked at him and I said, why does this keep happening to me? Like, why does this keep happening to me? And he said, I know why. When he said that, I was like, this is great. This is like a magical, he's going to give me the magic pill. He's going to wave that magical wand over me, and he's going to take this away from me, and I'm going to feel better. I'm not going to need a drug or a drink to feel normal and to not hurt every single person that I see. And he pointed a finger in my face, and he said, because you're a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. And I remember when he said that, he pointed the finger at me, and I was like, and he said it eight different times, pointing a finger. You're a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. Like, okay. So I left. I wanted to hurt him. Like, I wanted to punch this dude in the face. I get in the car. I call my wife. I call Lisa up. I'm saying, you're not going to believe this. So I go to this appointment. I tell this guy everything that I'm going through and how I need help. And Eight different times he points a finger in my face and calls me a drug addict and alcoholic. I'm a therapist. I'm supposed to have a trusting rapport, a therapeutic relationship with a person before I can start saying stuff like that. And I remember Elise saying, like, this is something that like is a aha moment that stuck with me. She goes, Pat, you might want to take a closer look about why you're so angry about what he said. I handled it very maturely. I told her to go F herself. I threw the phone on the ground. I hit the gas. I'm on 95, I-95. I'm driving. I go mile after mile after mile. And then for some reason, it just hit me. I hate that label. I hate it. I don't want people to know me as a drug addict. I don't want people to know me as an alcoholic. I don't want people to know me as someone who has to go to therapy or go to meetings. I don't want anybody to know that I am in recovery. I was ashamed of it. How could I work treatment with something that I hate? How could I go to an AA meeting with something I'm ashamed of? I had to learn to accept it. I had to learn that I'm powerless over it. And, uh, and that's what I did. I went back to this guy the next week. I continued going to AA meetings. I went to some NA meetings. Uh, I, I remember the next time I went and saw this guy, he was like, I didn't think I'd see you again. And I was like, I was, I told him, I was like, so pissed off about what you said. Like you pointed a finger on my face, like eight different times. You called me an addict and an alcoholic. He said, cause you needed to hear it. You needed to hear it. Uh, I stayed with him for a long time. Uh, and really started to peel back the layers of trauma, uh, bullying that stayed with me learning how to like live life on life terms without using a drug or a drink. I, I like this. I like this saying acceptance and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing 
happens in God's world without by mistake. Until I could accept my alcoholism, I could not stay sober. So true for me. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and my attitudes. Uh, and that's what I did. I went to AA meetings. I went to NA meetings. I've really changed my perception and my attitude regarding my addiction, my recovery. And also, the, for me, I truly believe addiction, and for most people, it is underlying. There's underlying things, like the trauma with my dad, which I said, it happened years ago. What, that's not bothering me now. Uh, depression, the, all the shame I had from all the things that I, I was really sad about and, and, and hurt my family members. Um, so, ODAT, one day at a time. That was really, really, really difficult for me. Uh, so I went to meetings. So what was different from meetings, and I, and I say this to uh, people that I work with all the time, I, being depressed and being, uh, you know, in a bad spot, not believing, I would go to meetings and I could hear 99 amazing things. But one thing that's negative or one thing I didn't appreciate would stick to me because I was depressed. I was sad. So I had to like really focus on finding one positive thing that'll stay with me. One positive thing. Even though that could have been really difficult for me, that refocused my, my mind in these meetings and had me keep going back. I continued to go to therapy. Um, I changed with people, places, and things. Well, I, very minor thing, but I really listened to other people who had my best interest. I, I could be really in a bad mood, irritable, and at least my wife could be like, you need a meeting. Before, I'd be like, dude, relax, I'm good. I'm not going to listen to you. Like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to go for a walk or something like that. But now she would be like, even if I was mad, I'd be like, you're right. I need to go to a meeting. I do not want to go, though. I just want to watch TV or something like that. But I got to go. Um, so for me, February 12th, 2010, I got a year. I was doing all the things I needed to do. Going to meetings, going to therapy, peeling back. But I was still struggling. Still struggling. I was reaching out for help, anything that I could do to, to get, get to the next day. And uh, I thought February 12th, 2010 would be a magical time because I had one year, four seasons. I would wake, I felt like I was going to wake up and like doves were going to fly out. And I'd be like walking on air and the most amazing feeling in the world because that craving is gone. Didn't happen for me. Uh, I struggled for another year. Um, I struggled for another year. I kept doing the things I needed to do in recovery, uh, and I kept having faith, but I, I struggled for another year. I remember I was walking my dog, Vinny, and I, I didn't think of alcohol. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I didn't think of alcohol or drugs, and I came home. I was like, Elise, you're not going to believe this. I didn't think about alcohol or drugs all day, and she was like, wow, great. Am I, am I supposed to be like, no, that's a big deal for me. That's a big deal for an alcoholic or a drug addict. Um, so I struggled for a while. I love showing this picture right here for everybody that's looking at it. I'm not going to spend that much time on it. Uh, but I, this is a gestalt image of an old and young woman. And I do this in groups. I do this for my students all the time by looking at it, because sometimes it's hard to see one of them. So Many people can see the old and young woman in it, but sometimes it's hard to see both of them. And you may only see one. That's what recovery looks like, I think, a lot of times. Um, I can only see one way. Life without alcohol and life involved in recovery was going to be hardship for me, no fun, and I didn't think I could do it. I already have all the evidence of all the relapses I did. So I was collecting evidence to show everybody and myself that there's no way I can do it. The interesting thing is, and the faith of what recovery offers and treatment is maybe you only see it one way. Maybe you only see the old woman and you're struggling seeing the young woman, but do you believe that the young woman's there? And why do you believe it? Oh, well, because you're telling me that. And because my buddy or my friend sees both but you don't still. 
So I spend a lot more time on, on this picture because this is like perception. Like perception for me when I first started recovery was that things were going to be awful and negative for the remainder of my life. I could not see it the other way. I could not see the other perception that life in recovery could be amazing. This is another one I like to share. So this is a fun one to read and I'm glad and I'm going to read it to you because I've, I've given this out. I, I worked at a Brooklyn behavioral hospital, the amazing place to work at one of the unbelievably helpful places for patients. Uh, so I used to give it out in groups all the time. And I remember after I would give it out in groups without saying anything, I remember somebody looking at me like, Dr. Mack, have us read this. This is the most depressing poem ever. And you're making my time in this hospital more depressed. I said, I'm glad you said that. So I'm gonna read it real fast. Today was the absolute worst day ever. And don't try to convince me that there's something good in every day. Because when you take a closer look, this world is a pretty evil place. Even if some goodness does shine through once in a while, satisfaction and happiness don't last. And it's not true that it's all in the mind and heart. Because true happiness can be attained only if one's surroundings are good. It's not true that good exists. I'm sure you can agree that the reality creates my attitude. It's all beyond my control. And you'll never in a million years hear me say that today was a good day. Now I ask everybody in here, um, and I ask my clients and my patients, so with, our, with everything that's happened in my past and everything that's happened in your past, we can't add anything to it. We can't take everything out, you know, but there's a way we can view it in a different light. And so without adding anything to this poem or changing the words or modifying it, I'm just going to look at it differently. And I'm going to read it backwards. And you'll, today was a good day. And you'll never in a million years hear me say that it's all beyond my control. My attitude creates the reality. I'm sure you can agree that it's not true that good exists only if one's surroundings are good. True happiness can be attained because it's all in the mind and heart. And it's not true that satisfaction and happiness don't last. Some goodness does shine through once in a while, even if this world is a pretty evil place. Because when you take a closer look, there's something good in every day. And don't try to convince me that today was the absolute worst day ever. So that took me, I think, about 20 minutes to write. I'm totally joking. There's no, I did not write that. I did not write that. It was written by, I, oh, I, I forget her name offhand. Please look it up. Worst day ever. Uh, she's, she was a teenager. She was in a competition. I think she came in third place, which I would have voted this the top one. But it's funny when I'll say that to, like, my students or uh, patients. Because right away, they know I didn't write it. They're like, bull crap. I'm like, why? You don't think I have the ability to write something like that? No, they're, everybody's too smart. I did not. Uh, so we, I spoke about trauma. I spoke about bullying, depression, struggles in recovery. I mean, in, in, in addiction, struggles in recovery. Um, I want to now spend a little bit of time talking about the gifts of recovery. I spoke about the gifts of alcohol and drugs. Um, this is something I did not think was possible, is the gifts of recovery. So whenever I, I'm talking to somebody who's struggling and they just are really in a bad spot and their story is really tough, and um, it's the magic of recovery. One of the great things about being very open about recovery, whether I'm wearing like on my license, on my, on my car, I have bumper stickers, one day at a time, let go and let God. I wear sober mode uh, hoodies. I promote this. I, I do a lot of discussions. I go around with the Beck Institute to awesome, amazing places where I'm doing workshops. I meet amazing people in recovery. I hear their stories. It's so inspiring. It's so beautiful. And nobody I've met has entered recovery because of an addiction or a mental health problem believing it was going to be the easiest road possible and that everything would happen like that. They had to work. Like, I was very lucky that I didn't die from my addiction. I didn't kill somebody else, but I worked my butt off for my recovery. Sleepless nights, nights where I spent crying, nights where I didn't want to go to a therapy appointment. I didn't want to go to an AA meeting or an NA meeting. Nights when I had to do the things I needed to do to get these gifts. 
So that's my wife. That's my daughter, Eva. That's my daughter, Morgan. So there are, Morgan's nine now, going on 17. She lets me know everything I do wrong. That I, I, don't, I use, I don't know if you guys noticed in this presentation, but my grammar might not be that great. She lets me know. And I'm pretty sure it's like a mom-daughter tag team against dad. Um, so that's, this is a picture that my daughter was, I, I don't even know how old she was, but I always wanted kids. Always wanted kids. And I never thought I'd have them. Um, I don't, I didn't know if I, I wanted kids, but with, I, I kind of, I didn't think I deserved kids and I didn't want to put their life through like miserable times. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure if I didn't get it in February 12th, 2009, I, I wouldn't be married still. Um, so after Morgan was born, you know, I had one of those emotional moments with Elise, my wife, and I said, listen. If I ever relapse again, you know, you're going to have to leave me. And I thought it would be like, it's okay. She was like, yeah, no, oh, yeah, definitely. I was like, oh, okay. okay. Oh, wow. Okay. I, yeah. Are you like, you didn't have to get emotional about it. It was like, she knows. Um, it's Morgan and Eva around Christmas. And the reason why I like sharing this stuff is because, I mean, this is what recovery gives you. Like this is, this is, these are things I didn't think were possible. Yep. My angels, <laughs> please, when they become teenagers, please reach out to me for help. I, okay. Cause I'm, I'm actually scared. Um, just being silly and, and dumb. I think my six year old and my nine year old all, already realized that they're smarter than their dad. <laughs> uh, I can be a family man. I'm always around. Um, and the one thing I'm blessed by being a professor right now is I can do so much. I volunteer in school, in their school. I try to do so much because I, I, love, I love being a dad. That's my daughter, Eva. Yes. Yeah. So if you're on my Facebook page, you notice that since the, uh, the pandemic that I've been getting weekly makeovers with uh, lipstick, uh, makeup. They love it. They bling they, they my hair by putting... I actually have like strands of hair. They actually put gems in. Um, but this is where Morgan dressed me up as a princess. I think I look pretty good. She did my nails. Taking trips, taking family vacations. So this was up the mountains. Um, I visited about uh, four years ago. My family, we visited the place my dad, my dad died at. Um, it's interesting because as a nine-year-old kid, the place looks huge. The pool looked huge. Everything, the cabin looked huge. I wasn't that big. Um, going back to it a few years, years ago as an adult, um, it brought back some really intense memories. Again, yeah, that's my show off. <laughs> Just being stupid. Uh, this is from Morgan. This is something that meant a lot to me when I got it. If I had a million dollars, I would buy you an Eagles movie because at that time she was an Eagles fan. Um, I really love it when you get candy for me. That still happens. I still bribe my kids all the time. And if I could tell you anything, it would be you're the best dad. Daddy. Like, wow. Like, it's hard to put into words. Um, so this is like being able to go to their school and volunteer whenever there was like anything that they have i was i'm able to do that like in recovery that's my dog we got him before the kids <laughs> he's my hairy son Vinny. um he was i mean believe it or not like he was there with me through struggles um and he was i mean he was very important to me in my recovery long walks you know basically being able to care for him and you know, like it, it's as weird as that might sound. Like he was, he was some, he was a family member who really helped me out through my struggles. Because I, the one thing is, you cannot do this by yourself. You can, mental health issue, whatever it is, or an addiction, you can't do it by yourself. As much as you would like to, it doesn't work like that. Yep. So as you could tell, Vinny takes after my appetite. That's that's a normal meal for him. That huge bone right there. Uh, I can do fun stuff with, with great friends. 
uh, escape rooms. This is uh, uh, two couples that my wife and I are great friends with, Keith, Amy, Beth, and Andrew. We do escape rooms. We do all kinds of fun stuff. We go to movie nights. Sober, like sober. They, they don't have um, any alcohol or, or drug problems, but this is something that I never thought about. I would never do. Like sober? <laughs> my God. If I was still drinking, they'd probably keep me in that room. They probably wouldn't let me out. Uh, like having fun with neighbors and friends. Uh, that's a buddy of mine, Nick, down the street. Uh, as you can tell, like I'm that neighbor who has a big Eagles guy out on the front lawn. <laughs> My wife loves it. She would love for anybody to pop that, but please don't. I'd be very. Um, this was a, a good moment in our lives. We were going, my neighbor down the street, Mario, is a Cowboys fan. So we decided we wanted to burn his Cowboys flag. That makes sense. That was, that was fun. That's his daughter right there, Sophia. And she was on board with it. So why not? Just, and that, that was the other thing, like, regarding football and, and drinking. That was a big thing, is football and drink. And to be able to, like, watch games sober, guess what? 2018, Eagles win the Super Bowl. Just for anybody who's not an Eagles fan out there. 2018, the Eagles won the Super Bowl, uh, and I remembered it. Uh, I had a buddy of mine recently say, hey, guess what? The, I pulled up this picture of us when we went to the Rams game at the vet. I have no clue what he's talking about. I, there's so many games and events that I don't remember because I was annihilated, and that's no way to live. It might not look it by the way I am right now, but I, I, I did sign up for the Broad Street, which I will be doing October 4th. And then right after that, I'm doing Naomi Stride, which is an awesome event everybody should be part of. But you're welcome, Nick. This is it. See, I told you. Naomi Stride is a beautiful event. However, uh, I got into running. Some of the things I never thought I did. I did the hot chocolate race. But you see that hot chocolate right there, the banana, the chocolate that's in there? I didn't have any of it. My daughter took it. Um, but I started to do the Broad Street. I started to do 5Ks. Uh, I really got into it and fell in love with it. And that's something that I never thought I would be part of. I ran a half marathon. That is my goal, again. Maybe a full marathon, but after the half, I don't know if it's actually ever possible for me to do that. Um, my mom, extremely proud of me. Uh, she was at the, the live time I did this. It's pretty awesome to see your mom proud. My mom did an amazing job, like with all her kids. Uh, all three of them are successful. All three of them were very close knit family. Uh, she was, if you knew my mom, she's not a happy person in this picture. It's freezing out. That was Thanksgiving. That was the gobble wobble that I ran. Uh, and I said, yeah, mom, it's so much fun. You'll be able to like hang out in this heated space. Nope, nope. She just sat out there freezing her butt off. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Uh, fun events. So that's my brother. That's his girl who's older now, Jordan. Uh, that's our family, you know, doing fun stuff. You know what? It's fun to be around me now because I'm sober and I'm not making everybody's life miserable right now. And this group of people, my wife and others in recovery, in AA, NA, in therapy, they're the reasons why I'm here right now. Uh, again, I'll pat myself on the back because, you know, I always say resilience, strength, and empowerment. That's what it does look like. That's what people who are in recovery from an addiction or mental health problem, that's what they have. But you need support from people around you. And the one thing is it's out there. I went for my doctorate. Uh, so in 2010, which is a little over a year after I started my recovery journey, I went back for my doc. I went for my doctorate, and uh, there were some people who who said, "No, don't do it. Don't do it. It's too stressful for you. You're early in recovery. You're not going to be able to succeed. Uh, you're going to relapse." And I just remember thinking, like, that's not what recovery is. Um, so I, I spoke to my therapist about it. I spoke to my family. Uh, we a good discussion of how intense it will be and how much of a struggle it will be, and I, I wanted to do it, and I and I did it. Uh, it's interesting when you're in recovery uh, and you're battling something that is a mental health problem or uh, an addiction, when someone next to you is like almost in tears because they got a 95 on their test 
and I'm looking at my grade and I got an 88, I'm like, I'm cool. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's okay. Like my, I, there's bigger things out there to worry about. I, I'll work harder on that 88, but I'm, I, I, I got this. I got this. Uh, so I graduated in 2015 with my doctorate. And there we are about to graduate. The next one, I'm getting strangled by a, a peer, which is great when they asked to do that. Uh, my kids were at my graduation. Like, I love this picture. Morgan Neva. Ooh. So I love this picture. And the fun thing for me is I worked at Brooklyn Behavioral Hospital for three years. And I was able to do some fun stuff there. And I dressed up every, I dressed up for Halloween, but I dressed up every St. Patrick's Day. And I went and I met all the patients dressed up as a leprechaun. So I thought it was cool to just stand outside and my kids could wave. I was waving the people going by. Uh, I still have that. I still wear it. It doesn't fit that much, but because I gained a couple pounds. But um, they, I, and I think Eva's actually scared of me right here, but you could do fun stuff like this. Um, that's a normal day in my life right there. That's normal. I, I, I wish that was Halloween, and I don't think it was. Um, just so you can put yourself out there and have fun. Uh, I was volunteering in my daughter's school uh, this year. Uh, that's Eva. She just started kindergarten uh, this year, and I could do stuff like this. Um, I was featured in the Holy Family's magazine. Uh, that's a pretty good-looking guy right there. So, but uh, in the uh, in the in the magazine, it's it, it tells my story, and I want to put it out there because I want, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm praying that the story connects to somebody who may be struggling or maybe early on, and it 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 kind of helps them through their their recovery, whether it's anxiety, PTSD, whether it's a personality thing, whether it's anything, an addiction, anything that just promote like being in recovery from mental health or addiction shows how strong you are, shows how resilient, shows how empowered. You'll see those words in a little bit. Uh, I see that all the time. Like resilient strength and empowerment isn't like right now, what I'm doing right now. I'm in a good spot right now. Resilient strength and empowerment is for someone who's like really struggling right now and, 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 and scared that they're not going to be able to find the next day. I had people who were crying hysterically in my groups in the hospital. And I would tell them that's resilience, that's strength. And they were like, but I feel so sh like sad. I feel weak. I feel scared. I feel anxious. You don't have to be in group right now. You could be in your room. You're out here. You're trying to face this. You're trying to like reach out for support on, with the fear that you still might not be able to do it. Resilience, strength, and empowerment. So I was uh, lucky enough to write a chapter in a book from the inside out, Therapist Confessions of Courage, Strength, and Hope. An amazing book. Other authors in there, um, you know, with other diagnoses and, and how they're like, you know, their stories of inspiration. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm already in talks with the, the publisher is I want to, I'm creating a book uh, for anybody in the health related field uh, who's in recovery to write a chapter. Uh, so that's in the beginning stages of it. So, I mean, hopefully I can get a lot of responses about that. Because other people's stories are so inspirational to hear. I love it. I, I embrace it. I love hearing other people. Uh, I am a professor at Holy Family University. Uh, I love it. Uh, these are my colleagues, Dr. Bonacquisti, Dr. Shea, who's on here right now, Dr. Frida Ginsburg, Dr. Mindy Cummins, and Dr. Diane Minego. I, I feel blessed. I love. First of all, I love teaching. Uh, I love working for the Beck Institute. This job allows me to do. Um, I love working with my students, and uh, it also, it does give me the flexibility to, to volunteer with my kids and to do a lot of the things that I want to do with my family. I really want to be there for my kids. Um, it's very, very important to me. Uh, recovery is lifelong. I will always, for the rest of my life, uh, go to AA. I'll go to NA, but I'll, I'll for the rest of my life, I don't, I'm not graduating from this. There's no graduation for recovery. The only difference is early in recovery, I hated it. I was ashamed of it. 
I felt weak. I felt like a failure. I felt like an F up. I felt like all those kind of things. Now I'm proud to be in recovery. I see the gifts it gives. Um, I feel resilient, strong, and empowered. I'm able to like deal with life on life terms. Like my problems didn't go away because I went into recovery. My problems were always there. It's the way I handled it. And the way I changed the way I thought about it is what helped me get to the point where I'm at right now. So I had two pictures, by the way, of my family right here. One without the Eagles, um, one of the Eagles. I, I did think St. Clair County and Central Nassau and everybody else who root for Dallas or Pittsburgh would enjoy seeing the Eagles. Go Birds. Some of the... Some of the things I love giving patients and I, I wish I had when I was early on is this. This is something that I share with people who are struggling on Facebook whenever they're talking about it. Um, really look for this. This is something that is just a good thing to have in your mind when you're struggling. Recovery will probably feel like you're getting worse. You'll be anxious, sweating, crying because what happens now? What happens when you let go? What's been the center of your life for so long? How do normal people do this? Is this normal? Is it too much? Is it too little? You've probably heard this before, but it gets worse before it gets better. Recovery will feel like you're dying a million times and every inch of you will scream at you to stop, to go back, to stop fighting, but don't give in. Life is waiting for you outside your comfort zone and it will get better. It will get easier. You won't always have to worry about what happens next time, next week, next month. It will get easier. I promise you. If you keep fighting, it will get easier. Don't give up now. And this is another one I love. One day it just clicks. You realize what's important and what isn't. You learn to care less about what people think of you and more about what you think of yourself. You realize how far you've come and you remember when you thought things were such a mess that they'd never recover. And then you smile. You smile because you were truly proud of yourself and the person you fought to become. This is another resource for people that helped me early on. I just really like this. It's the grapevine, it's AA in print. It doesn't replace meetings, um, but it's good to have. It, it is, if you look for the grapevine on Google, it can be e delivered to your house and like no one will know you're in AA or you're in recovery. It's very anonymous. Um, but it's another thing that it gives you a little nice insight and intake into the recovery world. Uh, AA, uh, it helps. Now, there's a lot of things I don't really care for. Uh, 13 stepping, which is something you can look if you don't know it. 12 uh, big book thumpers, step masters. I don't like when people who in AA, like they, it has to be a certain way or it's the wrong way. Um, it, it depends. People's journeys are a little different, but I think AA, no matter how many times you go or whatever, um, is truly important to someone's recovery. Uh, a lot of times I'll hear people say, like, I don't, I'm, I don't like the word God being in there. Then that can change. Let, let your higher power be something different. But do what I would like you to do is go there, and instead of picking all the negatives that can come out of it, try to find one positive thing to keep yourself sober. Just one positive thing um, that could help you start the streak of going on a regular basis. Uh, so I've been open about my recovery because of what I said in the very beginning. Um, I want to help people. I want people. I, I feel comfortable enough to share my story. Uh, I like it when I see other people sharing their stories. Addiction versus recovery, it's just, it's mind-blowing, the difference. Uh, it's all about me, what I want, how can I be the help of others? Uh, I can take care of myself, there is something bigger than me. Every addict who chose recovery instead of going out and getting high today, in case no, one to no one's told you yet, you're awesome. That goes for everybody. Everybody in here who's struggling, everybody who knows somebody struggling, you know, like, just letting people know how amazing they are, even though they don't feel it and they're struggling, is something that, uh, you know, sometimes they need to hear. And I just like this. Tell your story, shout it, write it, whisper it if you have to, but tell it. 
Some won't understand it, some will outright reject it, but the many, many will thank you for it. And then the most magical thing will happen. One by one, voices will start whispering, me too. And your tribe will gather and you will never feel alone again. That's kind of what we do. And just remember this. Now, when I worked at the hospital, what I loved, I said this so many times to people that I got a lot of letters when I was working at the hospital, which I loved. Um, and I, I still got them after I left because they didn't know I was gone, which is great. Uh, but people would send me letters with pictures of like tattooed of resilient. I don't promote like tattooing yourself up, um, but it, it, was, it meant something to them about being resilient, strong, and empowered. So I really want to thank everybody for listening to me today while I told my story of experience, strength, and hope. Uh, I really do appreciate it. If you have, if there's, we're going to have a question and comment time right now, but if you don't feel comfortable or like later on you have a question, that's my email address. Please reach out to me with whatever questions or any way that I can help you. Um, and also I wanted to share October 4th, uh, NAMI Bucks County, which if you go to their website, if this is the first time you're checking out NAMI Bucks County uh, for the first time, go to their website, Facebook uh, messages. Nick, Amy, and the group there, support groups every time you turn around. <laughs> like if anybody is out there struggling, please reach out. Send, that, send them the website. Tell, I tell people all the time, check out NAMI Bucks. Check out NAMI Bucks. But um, they were having a, a stride event that needed to be canceled because of uh, the pandemic. And what, what a fitting, what an amazing title of the October 4th NAMI stride. Hope is not canceled. So it's going to be October 4th. It's going to be at 1 o'clock. You, you'll get information for it. I hope to see everybody there. I'm running the Broad Street in the morning, and I'm going to crawl on my hands and feet <laughs> in the NAMI stride event because it's going to be painful. But uh, I'd love to see everybody there. And again, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pat.